Sometimes it's not the simplicity of the question, but how unexpected the question seems. Ashley, my wife of 23 years, just asked me, are you going to headquarters this month? It seems simple enough. A quick calculation says I've been doing this for over 100 months straight. I am the manager of a large grocery store. My store is part of a national chain and one of the most profitable in the region. I attend monthly meetings on the second Thursday of every month. I am on a 7 a.m. flight and return on a 10 p.m. flight. It's a long day, but always full of meetings and presentations. We end the day with a team building dinner. I get home around 1 a.m. and usually work half a day that Friday. At my job, I hire more teenagers than adults. They are known for asking questions that have little to do with what they actually want to ask. Something like, will we have fresh food this Saturday is often followed a few minutes later by the question, can I take Saturday off? This seems off topic, but Ashley hasn't asked me about going to this meeting in at least five years. She knows I'll go. There's no need to ask. Why then did she need confirmation this time? In poker, I think they call it a tell I made a mental note. Later in the evening, I paid the bills. In fact, I handle almost every aspect of our financial lives. Ashley's most recent credit card statement for her individual account showed a couple of purchases at Angie's Elegant Rags Fashion Boutique. Nothing strange, except that she had previously criticized them for their absurd prices. Years ago, I discovered that when Ashley wanted to hide a birthday or Christmas present, she would hide them under extra blankets in the hallway linen closet. The next morning, while Ashley was in the shower, I checked her hiding place and found nothing. I guess you can't always be lucky, but it also told me that the purchase wasn't made with me in mind. I combed through her closet, but to no avail. I almost forgot about that purchase until Friday after work. One of my chores was to inflate the tire on Ashley's car. When I was looking for the compressor in her trunk, I found two bags from Angie's Elegant Rags. One bag contained a box of blue high-heeled shoes, the other a light blue cocktail dress. The soles of the shoes were scratched they were in use. It doesn't take much imagination to think that once the shoes have been worn, the dress is no longer in perfect condition either. Was there some party I forgot about? It didn't make sense why hide the dress. Surprise at a party for what? Our 46th birthdays were a few months ago, and our wedding anniversary was a month ago. There was no reason for my work to reward me in any way. I couldn't think of a compelling reason to hide the dress and shoes. Perhaps the dress and shoes were not hidden at all leaving them in a trunk may have been a mistake. Above all my guesses stood the fact that the shoes were used. I made another mental note. Mark had never been the life of the party, but he always maintained friendly relationships with his colleagues. Every day at lunch they discussed the news, joked around, and sometimes shared personal stories. But in recent weeks, Mark had become withdrawn, often declining to join them for lunch and answering questions with single words. Something wrong, Mark David, a colleague and longtime friend, asked one day. You haven't been yourself lately. Mark stirred his coffee nervously. He knew he couldn't hide his dejected state from David, but he didn't want to share his suspicions either. It's nothing, just some problems at home, he replied evasively, hoping David wouldn't press him further. Serious problems, David persisted. You know, I had a friend who also seemed down, stopped hanging out with us. Turned out his wife was cheating on him. He didn't suspect anything for a long time, and then he accidentally found some of her messages. David fell silent, studying Mark. His words hit Mark like a punch in the gut. Did David suspect something? Of course, it's probably nothing like that with you, David added quickly. I'm just saying, sometimes it's better to know the truth, no matter how painful it is. Don't keep it all bottled up. On Saturday afternoon, after I finished mowing the lawn, I ran up the stairs, undressed, and turned on the shower. I had bought shampoo earlier that day. It was in a bag on the stairs. I put the shampoo on the first step so I wouldn't forget it. It worked well. I wrapped a towel around myself and headed back down the stairs. I heard Ashley's cell phone ringing. Ashley answered her cell phone, so I remained silent. I grabbed the shampoo bag and started up the stairs. Hey sis, how are you? We'll talk about this when Mark isn't around. He's upstairs taking a shower. Okay, love you too. Bye, Ashley's sister Mindy is two years younger than Ashley, and she and I tried to avoid each other. We used to get along, but after her divorce, she thinks all men are scum. I can't wait to spend time with her. And Ashley knows it. It's not that she's mean to me. 
It's just that she has such a negative attitude towards men. Mindy has her own quirk. You never know what color her hair will be from visit to visit. I can't understand some of those bright colors. Maybe you're walking through the mall and you see someone with ice cream and you think, I could probably look like that I thought about this conversation while taking a shower. I never thought about spying on Ashley. With two recent strange events and the tone of what I just heard, the scales tip towards espionage. This is not the time to put off calling. I'm going to run out of business. Do you need anything? I can't think of anything my first stop was the library. I used their computers to search the internet for a voice-activated recorder. I found the right one and then found a store that sold it. After shopping, I stopped at my grocery store and bought some fruit and snacks. It's better to come back with something if I'm running errands. Ashley spends a lot of time in the kitchen. Her computer workstation is in the corner at the kitchen table. She can turn her chair and look at the TV on the wall in the living room. I attached the recording device to the side of the fan. The fan needed cleaning, so this became my cover. My name is Mark. Counting the time we dated, Ashley and I have been together for 25 years. We both started out as fitness enthusiasts, but that ended a long time ago. I could do with losing 50 LBS, and Ashley, although still slim, could easily lose 30. I'm not a vain person, so my excess weight doesn't bother me at all. Ashley complains about being overweight and starts a diet, but after a few weeks, the diet becomes history. I'm busy with housework and my motorcycle. We spend many weekends with our neighbors. Ashley reads books and watches a lot of reality TV. I could never get into those TV shows. Ashley works as a receptionist at a hospital. Our only child, Alex, married Kelly a year ago, and we are proud grandparents to Jared, who is six weeks old. When Kelly returns to work in a few weeks, Ashley plans to start daycare to save them on childcare costs. Ashley plans to reduce her hours at the hospital. She keeps the money she earns for her personal fund. When we first got married, Ashley and I were like stereotypical newlyweds. We had intimate moments in the morning or evening or both. This went on for several months until Ashley discovered that she was pregnant. Perhaps typically, the intimacy began to wane and never returned after a few months. For the next 20 years, we were intimate a couple of times a week. Over the past few years, the frequency has decreased to once a week. I tried to broach the subject Ashley. Don't you think we should see a marriage counselor or something like that to see if they can help bring energy back into our love life? I think you're overreacting. Don't you still get it at least once a week? Yeah, but it seems pretty mechanical right now. I'm just trying to find a way to make it romantic again. We don't need some psychiatrist smirking at us. We're fine the way we are. I'm going shopping. That's all. As we stand, it's hard to imagine that all married couples go through this. We used to go to flea markets or the zoo, but now she sits and watches her recorded TV shows. I ride a motorcycle to pass the time. Ashley used to go with me, but that was also several years ago. We lived together, and that's it. I thought that when Jared showed up, things might change. It must have changed since Ashley spends a lot of time at Alex's. About a year ago, after at least a couple of years of being together, I visited a divorce lawyer. She stated the facts I had to pay Ashley a significant allowance. Although I asked the lawyer to draw up the paperwork, I ultimately decided that perhaps I was overreacting to the situation. I didn't want to hurt Ashley. I just wanted my life back, living with someone who enjoyed their time with me. I put the divorce papers on my desk. I haven't brought this up with Ashley, but living with someone who acts like she'd rather be somewhere else is getting hard to bear. I think it started when Alex left for college. She seemed lost in the empty house. I didn't think she cheated on me, but I trusted her completely at the time, so I could easily ignore the red flags if they were flying. Obviously, these recent events have caused me to question my unconditional trust. What kept bothering me was that I had so many opportunities to stray, and I remained completely faithful. The store has many regular customers, and many of them are single widows and divorcees. I was winked at, groped, and even propositioned, but I survived it all. I just assumed that Ashley saw in me what I saw in her and would never leave. Reality is offensive. I found this great little voice detection tool. I insert the memory card from the recorder into my laptop and launch this tool. It downloads everything and creates a text file. I can then quickly review the results and see if there is anything alarming. The only downside to where I placed the recorder is that I need a stool to reach it. I have to wait until Ashley goes to bed before reviewing the day's notes. Many words were translated incorrectly, 
but I could understand the general meaning of the conversation. My concerns grew when Ashley spoke with Mindy again on Tuesday. Hey sis, how are you K? No, not yet. Probably within the next hour and a half, no, no, no. I think so, it's so boring here. I don't care about him anymore? Maybe next week? Mark has a month-long trip to head office. He'll be out Thursday night. Yes, I work with him. Katie was with him. She says he's normal. You know, it's probably just this one time. Just to spice up my life, why do you care? You don't even get along, he'll never know. He might even like it if I learn a few tricks. You have your own opinion, Mindy. Mindy seemed different. I hear the garage opening. I need to go. Love you too, sis. Buy my guts twisted. I didn't know anything concrete, but the hints tore me apart. I searched the internet for a private detective. I drank about six ounces of whiskey and fell asleep on the couch. Good morning, dear. Why were you sleeping on the couch? My stomach was bothering me, damn. Look at the time. I have to hurry. I have an early meeting. I had plenty of time and didn't have a meeting, but I couldn't even look her in the eye. After several calls in the morning, I spent the afternoon meeting with a divorce lawyer. I reviewed our family financial situation with her. She suggested that I quit or take a sabbatical, everything else would be divided in half. I'd use the trip to headquarters to quit. My lawyer also gave me some good advice about banking and investing. I spent the afternoon doing some of these things. I checked at Angie's, and they don't sell used shoes. Any love I had left was leaking out like air from a nailed tire. Ashley, look at these printouts. These are charges on our joint credit card. I have been informed that our account has been compromised and will be canceled. New cards will be mailed. We need to figure out which of these charges are not ours. From now on, use your own credit card. Are we going to have to pay for purchases we didn't make? No. That's one of the good things about credit cards. If it's not your purchase, you don't pay. Of course, since I made up this nonsense about the call from the credit card company, all the payments were ours. I cut up our common cards. Ashley, I read online that sometimes, when they have your credit card, they can also access your bank account. What do you think about transferring all but $100 into a savings account? These accounts are not connected since they are in different banks. Do you think so? You know I don't spend much time on our finances. Do what you need to do our savings account did not have an ATM link. I made the changes electronically and then waited until Ashley went to bed. Over the next few days, nothing noteworthy was found on the recorder. There was someone else in the kitchen on Monday night. I found the appropriate place in the recording and listened. It was Mindy and Ashley. This is unexpected. Did you have business on this side of town dentist appointment? Thought I'd pop in and try to revive you one last time. Sorry, sis. I'm fed up with this life. It's time for a change. I had lunch with him today. Damn, you're an idiot. What if Mark finds out and files for divorce this will be a one-time thing? Dinner, dancing, and who knows what else. I'm looking forward to having lunch with him afterward. Don't do this. I've been on the other side of this crap. Don't do this, I have to go. Traffic through town could be a problem. I'll call you tomorrow. Okay, be careful, I think that's it. I sent an email confirming a meeting with a private investigator and another letter to my lawyer to update the claim. At lunchtime on Tuesday, I assigned a private investigator to keep an eye on Ashley throughout Thursday. Once he is sure that she is heading to her lover's house or hotel, she will need to be served with a summons. After work, I stopped and looked at a few places for long-term stays. Ashley was annoyed when I came home two hours late. Isn't your phone working? Your dinner is cold. Heated up yourself, she disappeared into the bedroom. I left the food on the stove. I had bought some fast food earlier. I have made a list of people to call, things to say, and various minor things to do in a divorce. On Tuesday, the recorder again showed one side of the conversation. Hi, hi, sis. What's new? You sound like a stuck record. It'll be a one-time thing. That's what I told him. Well, maybe you're right, and I'll like it and change my mind. I guess that's the risk I'm taking. Who would want him if he leaves me? He's become so boring. So good luck to him. If that happens, he's a real jerk lately. Yeah, that's right. I guess I don't notice anything from all these love-hungry women. Maybe I really am. We'll talk later. I don't think they ended their calls with love you anymore. It looks like things are getting pretty tense. My opinion of Mindy has definitely changed. Alex came home for the weekend and immediately sensed that the atmosphere in the house was strained. 
His parents tried to act normal, but he could see the chasm that had opened between them. His father seemed lost, and his mother was irritable and distant. Dad, is everything okay between you and Mom, he asked one evening when Ashley was at work. Mark looked up from the TV. He was watching some mindless reality show, but he couldn't even remember what it was about. What do you mean he snapped? Well, you guys barely talk, and Mom is always on edge, Alex began, but his father cut him off. Don't pry into things that don't concern you, Mark said sharply. Your mother and I are fine. These are adult matters. Wednesday night, after a quiet dinner with Ashley, I packed. There has been no hugging, kissing, or intimate moments since the discovery was made last week. I'm no longer surprised that Ashley is emotionless. I left an hour earlier than usual on Thursday morning, long before Ashley woke up. During the drive to the airport, it occurred to me that I might never sleep in this house again. For a week now, Mark had been living with this secret, like a ticking bomb strapped to his chest. The days stretched endlessly, and each new revelation from the unsuspecting Ashley felt like a dull ache in his gut. He was looking forward to Thursday the day he could start taking action. Wednesday evening, reviewing the reports from the bug he had planted in Ashley's car, Mark noticed that the latest recordings were interrupted by strange static. He rewound, then again, but the result was the same, instead of his wife's voice, just unintelligible noise. Mark felt a prickle of anxiety. What if the bug had malfunctioned? Or worse, Ashley was suspicious and had found a way to disable it. He realized this could derail his entire plan. While waiting to board, Ashley called. You left before I woke up early flight this time, no. I had to stop by the office. What are your plans for the day I work until four, and then nothing? I'll probably watch recorded shows. Are you still coming back on the night flight? Yes, they're starting to board. See you later, I pressed the end call button without waiting for her last words. This week I registered for a new phone. I was going to cancel our phone bills as soon as the paperwork was served. I used the airport wait time and flight time to copy everything from the old phone to the new one. It's so easy now, just keep them together and choose a few items to transfer everything. At headquarters, things went much better than I expected. I was put on indefinite academic leave. If I return to work, I will retain my seniority and rights to pension savings for the reason explained. They did so immediately. I offered to mentor my successor if they wanted. I was on pins and needles waiting for the detective's report. At six, I called Ashley. Hey Mark, how was your day very good? What's new at home? Not much really. Boring day. When do you need to be at the airport? I'm heading to dinner with colleagues and then straight to the airport from there. Same procedure, different month. What are you going to do tonight? Just eat the leftovers and watch my TV shows well. Have a good time. You know I love you. We'll talk later, I love you too. Since I was no longer working, I didn't go to dinner with my colleagues. I stopped and ate some healthy fast food. The first message from the detective came while I was eating my salad. The target is on the move. So much for I love you. I called my home phone and left a message. What's happening tonight? I called Ashley's cell phone, but it went to voicemail. What's interesting going on tonight? After dinner, I headed to the airport. I walked around the boarding gate restlessly, full of anxiety. I desperately wanted to know if I would have a wife or a new life. My text signal rang almost simultaneously with the call from Ashley. I left the call unanswered. The text was from the detective target failed. I wasn't listening to Ashley's voicemail when I received her text mark, please don't do this. I haven't cheated on you. Yet. Perfect. More reason why I'm getting a divorce, I typed back. I took a photo of the text with my new phone, then called, and canceled our cell phone bill. I also canceled our cable TV, this effectively removed our home Wi-Fi. The private investigator sent a video to my email with today's events. The first part of the video shows Ashley leaving the house in her slinky blue dress with matching heels. Now everything becomes clear. Her first stop was a pharmacy, then she went to a hotel near the hospital. After a short wait, she was greeted in the lobby by a man who was 10 years younger than her. Drinks and dinner with touching and caressing hands. Several dances with freedoms allowed and accepted. They gathered their coats and headed to the elevators. As soon as they reached the door of their room, and the man inserted his key card, my man approached Ashley. A.R., you have been served with a subpoena. Mr. Bennett, 
you will be served with a claim for alienation of affection. If you are married, your wife will receive copies of my report along with photographs and videos. I hope you have a pleasant evening. Ashley tore open the envelope while the man stood there looking stunned. When Ashley realized what was in the envelope, she collapsed to the floor. I've also included the full text of the conversations from the kitchen. Ashley was screaming something, but I couldn't make it out. The video ended. I used my new phone to call my son and tell him my new number. I informed him that I was divorcing his mother due to her infidelity. I asked him to keep my new number secret, as I didn't want anyone else to know it. He reluctantly agreed. My flight home gave me the time I needed to lower my blood pressure it really takes over your body. I didn't expect to be met at the airport. As I entered the arrivals area, I heard my name. Ashley ran up to me. I dodged her attempt to hug me. She no longer had her blue outfit on. Mark, please. I love you. Don't do this. Can we talk about this what? I don't even deserve a blue dress and heels. I guess you saved those for your lovers. I'm sorry, Mark. It's not like that. I shouldn't have changed. I mean, I shouldn't have worn this. I'm so embarrassed. I'm sorry I shouldn't have Ashley. This is not the time or place to talk. Go home. I'm going home too. Are you going straight home? Or do you need to stop somewhere for more experiences, Mark? I'm sorry I'm going straight home. Again, I had to push away her attempt to hug and kiss me. I didn't lie, I was heading to my house. This will be my new long-term home. It took a lot more whiskey to calm down. My son woke me up around 6 a.m. Dad, mom is crazy, just call her. Don't drag me into this, okay, Alex? Sorry about that, son. Talk to you soon. I used the hidden number feature to call Ashley at home. Our old mobile phones were turned off. Hello, Ashley, this is Mark. Get a lawyer and have him contact my lawyer, damn you, Mark. I was worried that something had happened to you. It's a little late to worry about me, Ashley. I'm tired of being taken for granted. Get a lawyer and I hung up. It's very strange to wake up without work. I walked a few blocks to the cafe. The weekday special was perfect for me. After breakfast, I told my lawyer and the private investigator my new phone number and address. My lawyer called shortly after noon to tell me that the bank and brokerage accounts had been frozen. She advised me to drop the alienation of affection claim because we had no evidence of any intimate activity. The private detective sent an additional letter the man involved was single, although he lived with his girlfriend. Perhaps I will take revenge, but now it doesn't matter to me. They worked together so I could cause problems at the hospital if Ashley objected to the divorce. We will both need cash for ongoing expenses so the lawyers will have to negotiate a fair amount and frequency for these payments. I filed a claim to split the costs of the house and my current residence. If Ashley wants to move out of the house, we can sell it faster. I will pay for my place, and she will pay for her living expenses. My suit based on treason will not last, I did it for shock effect. I spent my first day of freedom crossing items off my list. My friends were shocked but supported me. My mother, the eternal optimist, was for reconciliation. I told her I would do it as soon as she grew wings. With a low-paying job, no cash, and a low-limit credit card, Ashley faced a difficult time. I called to talk to Alex, but Kelly answered. How is my beloved daughter-in-law? Sweet, really sweet. Not only am I your favorite, but I'm also the one you hate the most. Do you have any idea how many times Ashley called? She's acting incoherent, sometimes screaming, sometimes crying now you are truly my favorite. I am glad that she is suffering. This is just a small part of what she put me through. I don't think I want to know, but I'm not an idiot. Is she having an affair? Not only are you beautiful, but you're also smart. My detective ambushed them last night. I'm a little concerned about letting her sit with Jared. I can't make that decision for you. I'd love to meet you for dinner, not necessarily tonight, but I have a full calendar right now. I'll talk to Alex. Is this a good number to call you back? Yes, it is. Please don't share it with anyone. Talk to you soon. Love to everyone, love you too, Dad. Goodbye. Friday night was emotionally draining. The impact of everything that had happened had taken its toll. I tried to solve my problems with a little alcohol and a lot of painkillers. It was well after midnight when I finally found sleep. Breakfast on Saturday morning with Alex, Kelly, and Jared was enjoyable. They started ignoring some of Ashley's calls. After breakfast, I stopped by our old house. I couldn't tell if Ashley's car was in the garage, so I parked up the street and looked through the window on the side of the garage. She was home, so I decided to try again later. 
I might have to buy a clean shirt if I can't get inside soon. Hey Alex, long time no see, huh? Can you take your mom out or meet her? I need to stop by and grab a few things of course, Dad. I'll call you back in about 10 minutes. She'll meet us for lunch at noon. After I saw that Ashley had left, I entered and began a full search of the house. I left a note came by to talk. Guess you're getting more impressions I moved my motorcycle to a friend's house a few blocks away. I walked back and filled my car, which was full when I left the house. I stopped at an inexpensive clothing store and stocked up on snacks. I bought a thank you card that I addressed to Mindy and included copies of the text from the kitchen notes Mindy. Thanks for trying. I spent Saturday afternoon and most of Sunday watching the Palmer races. I need a hobby because retirement is too boring and this was just my first day off. I bought the Sunday newspaper and looked at the advertisements for volunteer opportunities. On Sunday, I sat in a paramutual betting section next to Martin, a retired insurance agent who was an avid horse gambler. He got me interested in betting. He proudly announced his selections and won good money in bets that day. I repeated several of his bets, won several times, lost several times, and ended the day with $20 in the black. Pretty cheap entertainment for the day. Monday morning, I filled out the paperwork to become a volunteer at an animal shelter. My lawyer called to set up a meeting with me, Ashley and her lawyer. The meeting was scheduled for Thursday at 16 hours. Otherwise, I spent about five hours with Martin. He lost several large bets but still managed to make a small profit. I lost about $10 still pretty cheap fun. On Wednesday, I started working at an animal shelter. I had a four-hour shift. The love from these little creatures came at just the right time in my life. After my shift on Thursday, I settled into the conference room. Ashley did her best to look presentable. Her lawyer and my lawyer showed us their grimaces. Corrals began. Ashley and I sat in silence while the lawyers argued. I deliberately sat on the same side of the table as Ashley so that we would not look at each other. We will not accept a plea based on charges of treason. Mrs. Ashley, what did you buy at the pharmacy the night you were served with the summons? Don't answer that. It should be changed to irreconcilable differences. We'll take that into account. Anything else you didn't include child support good point. Since Mrs. Ashley is the only one working, I propose that Mr. Ashley receives 25% of her net earnings. Ashley exploded no way. He has a great job. A few weeks off won't change that. Mr. Attorney, he did have a great job. He is currently unemployed, and that was before Mrs. Ashley received the subpoena. We propose to remove the mention of infidelity and agree to no alimony from both parties. If this agreement is filed with prejudice, can I have a few minutes with Mrs. Ashley? They left the conference room. I watched Ashley twist and turn in her chair. She needed a few wipes before we were called back. We have several conditions. First, if Mr. Ashley finds gainful employment within the next 12 months. The issue of child support will be reconsidered. We want to eliminate the request to share the cost of Mr. Ashley's home. He is always welcome in his home. The home will be immediately offered for sale and upon sale. The proceeds will be divided 60 to 40 in favor of Mrs. Ashley. We request that the savings account be divided equally and paid immediately. Can I have a few minutes with Mr. Ashley, they left the conference room. I quickly calculated the cost of the house. We had about $300,000 in net worth. If it comes to me, I can refuse $330,000 if I agree. We decided to accept the offer with conditions. We agreed to this with one exception. Until the house is sold, Mrs. Ashley will bear all expenses for the house. If the house does not sell within six months, it will be put up for auction after a few whispered comments. An agreement was reached. As I was about to leave, Ashley asked, Mark, would you stay and talk to me, Ashley? As soon as the documents are signed and sent, I will meet with you. I should have felt great that everything had gone so well, but I sat alone in my room, sipping whiskey in the dark. I thought about how many people would change their minds about marriage. Most of us develop our personalities over time, for many different reasons, ranging from parenting styles to life experiences. Some people believe that we never change throughout life, or, in other words, we are born a certain way and simply become more evolved as we live. They believe that human nature does not change. According to them, some of us are just born with certain tendencies and spend most of our lives becoming more pronounced versions of ourselves. 
they argue that even those with negative tendencies can show restraint in certain situations such as at work when they are in the presence of people who control their destiny. They pretend to be civilized until they gain control, and then their natural tendencies take over again. Another theory is based not on nature but on nurture or experience. This theory says that we are not born with fixed traits, but that people or experiences shape us throughout our time here. Essentially, life trains us to be who we are. There are many versions of both of these theories, but if I had to choose, I'd be hard-pressed to do so. I believe that each of us is born with both sets of genes, and these traits can be activated or deactivated due to extremely stressful events in our lives. I also believe that these traits may appeal to some people and not to others. After you hear my story, you might feel the same way. My name is Mark. I'm 5 e tall, have brown hair and brown eyes, and am quite reserved by nature. I generally try to get along with people. I don't think I've had a fist fight since I left elementary school. On the other hand, I have been doing martial arts and boxing since I was eight years old. I came home from third grade with a bleeding nose, and my dad, an old army guy, signed me up for karate classes. Of course, I still wasn't any stronger, and the big guys still sometimes walked away with my lunch money. But I wasn't afraid anymore. Knowing how to fight and probably kick their asses didn't make me a bully. It just gave me a choice. I could either fight them and probably hurt them. Or I could just give them the 50 cents and eat later without all the trouble that fighting would bring. I guess I've just never been the alpha male type. I married Ashley a couple of years after I graduated from college, and things were going great for us. I loved her, and she loved me. We have a two-year-old daughter, a wonderful home, and a wonderful home and a wonderful life. Ashley is a little chubby, but I had fallen in love with her heart. I think it was my character that attracted her to me. Ashley dated a couple of guys who were pretty rough. Although she's not fat, Ashley treated herself the same way they say fat girls do. She thought that she would have to try harder and lower her standards to get a guy. Some of the guys she dated manipulated her quite easily and didn't treat her the way she deserved. When we met, it was great for both of us. She knew I wouldn't force her to do anything she didn't want intimacy or otherwise. I am still very reserved and calm, so our arguments are rare. I tend to look at the big picture and try to think about the other person's point of view, as well as my own. I try to avoid conflicts, especially in cases where they are not necessary. After she dated some rough guys, Ashley's parents fell in love with me, so when we got married, everyone was happy. Our two families merged into one big one with Ashley and me at the center. When our daughter Sophia was born two years ago, it was as if the world, or at least our piece of the world, tilted on its axis, and Sophia became the sun. Ashley quit her job and stayed home to take care of Sophia. Honestly, I was making enough money that we both didn't have to work, and Ashley was actually tired of working. She suggested staying at home. I just assumed that, with both of us working, we would be able to put more money into our savings and investments. I, of course, lost this argument, and Ashley became a housewife while I became the sole breadwinner. This is how most of our cases went. I was not the kind of husband who liked to rage. Ashley's father often told me I was a coward, but he still loved me. I'm glad my girl married you, and not those jerks she used to date, he often said. In fact, most people who know us don't think the word no is in my vocabulary. Everyone is absolutely confident that Sophia will have me wrapped around her finger and take control of the house by the time she's five or six. It didn't bother me because my world revolved around Ashley and Sophia. There was nothing I wouldn't do for either of them. I think there were times when I should have been more assertive, but at the end of the day, their happiness made me happy. On the days when I had a really hard day at work and just wanted to go home, relax on my porch, have a beer, and enjoy a quiet dinner, I would come home to find that Ashley had gathered a group of people for a chat. As soon as I crossed the threshold, she would immediately hand me Sophia. I took it in stride. I tried to see it from her point of view. She took care of Sophia all day, and we did it together, so I had to spend time taking care of her too. Ashley also worked at home all day, making a home for all of us, so she never had the opportunity to go out or interact with adults the way she did when she worked. I agreed with this, but I never really complained about much. Maybe in some ways I was a coward. I mean, I can break boards with my bare hands or feet. I weigh 170 lbs and lift 250, but I'm still a coward. I just don't have the Neanderthal gene. I probably would have gotten through life without ever getting angry if it weren't for one phone call. 
I almost never use our home phone. I use it so rarely that I don't know the number. Even when Ashley calls me, my iPhone doesn't show a number, it just shows home. So that day, when my phone was uncharged, and I needed to call a mechanic because my Taurus was acting strange again, my world changed. When I picked up the phone, I heard voices. Normally I would have hung up immediately, but I heard Ashley laughing, and it sounded like she was talking about me. No, I don't think he even noticed we weren't there, she laughed. Don't get me wrong, baby. I love Mark, and always will. But I don't think he would say anything if he caught us having sex. He would probably just say sorry and leave the room. Yes, said the man, whose voice I recognized but couldn't place. He's so cute. He'd probably offer to spread your leg so I could take you. Oh, Tyler, stop exaggerating, Ashley laughed. Besides, your wife is no better. Just do what I tell her, Tyler said, if she knows what's good for her. But damn, at least we're not doing this in her house. Mark, I just don't know about him. Hey, while we're on the subject, my boss is a member of the same Masonic Lodge as your father. Is Mark a puppet too? Yeah, my dad got him into it a few years ago. They remind me of the damn Flintstones with their funny hats and all these rituals. They are like a loyal troop of water buffalo. Well, I want to be a water buffalo, said Tyler. If I join their lodge, I'll have more time to connect with my boss after work. This will give me a better chance in a few months when it comes time for a promotion. I'll start dropping hints about this to Mark Ashley said. As long as you make me happy, I'll keep you satisfied. If it makes you happy, Tyler said. But if you love Mark so damn much, why do you need me? Because I'm bored, Ashley said. I'm stuck at home with the baby all day. Mark loves me, and I love him, but with you. I can play a different role. I can be someone else. I don't know how long this will last. Maybe I'll be bored with you too. I'd drop you like a hot rock if I even thought Mark would find out about us. But as long as he doesn't know anything, we're in. I sat and held the phone for several minutes after they hung up. I heard Ashley walking through the house and quickly went outside. I walked around the house and came back through the front door, as if I wasn't there. Hey baby, she smiled as I walked in. She came up to me and leaned in for a kiss. I studied her face. There was no sign of the lies or disrespect she felt for me. I stood there perhaps too long before I turned away from her. What happened, dear, she asked. Did you have a bad day at work? Work was going well, I said. The Taurus will have to go into the shop again. Can I use your car? Of course, baby, she said. But it's just a car. They break down. Get used to it. That's not the reason you didn't kiss me when you came in. I've been thinking about you all day. I look forward to our time together. Sorry, I said, and walked away looking for her keys. Where are you going, she asked. I'm going to the dojo, I said. She simply smiled. When I needed to get something out of my system, I would often go to a local karate school run by a friend of ours. Ashley laughed about it because she had never seen me hit a person. Sometimes she saw me doing katas or breaking boards, but my wife, like everyone else, was sure that I wouldn't say a word even if my mouth was full. I think she didn't believe I was capable of hitting someone, even in anger. I was more of a talker than a fighter. She was right. That night, I beat the poor punching bag. I tried to drive out the anger and pain with blows, but I couldn't do it. My anger and pain settled like a ball of fire in the pit of my stomach. Even when I was so tired that I couldn't lift my arms anymore, I couldn't let it go. This was something new for me. I'd changed. I knew I wasn't going to go home and confront Ashley, but I started to think about her differently from that moment on. For the first time since I first saw her, I didn't think of Ashley as one of my own. In fact, I didn't want her anymore. Even though I've heard that love doesn't disappear so quickly, I didn't love her anymore. I was sure of it. I knew something had to change because I was angry. I wanted Ashley to experience the same pain and suffering that I did. I knew I had to be smart about this. I had to plan and think about what I wanted to do. I started planning in my mind what I wanted to say to her. I needed to do it in a way that would affect her as much as possible. I am a strong person. I thought, both mentally and physically. I am strong. I may not be able to lift my arms right now, but I am strong. I gathered my strength and pulled myself together. Martial arts is great for this kind of thing they teach you to concentrate. 
With the possible exception of a firmer expression on my lips, I was able to hide my feelings to such an extent that my new feelings did not show. I might look calm on the outside, but on the inside I wasn't. I screamed inside myself, feeling only rage and pain. I had so many questions that I needed answers to. On my way home, I asked Siri to help me. For those who don't know, Siri is the personal assistant on the iPhone. I simply told Siri to find me a private investigator, and my phone screen showed three of them in my area. I chose a guy who was on his way home. I don't know what I expected. I guess I wanted to see Humphrey Bogart or Robert Mitchum hell. I'd settle for Columbo or even Barnaby Jones. I expected to see a seasoned veteran with plenty of life experience underneath his rumpled suit. I wanted someone with enough life experience who had already seen and experienced everything. What I got was a 20-something-year-old with a belly and three days of stubble, reading a video game magazine. He looked at me with eyes that had seen too much Modern Warfare 3. What do you need, he asked. I explained the situation to him, and he grabbed a worn leather jacket from the rack next to the Xbox. Where are we going, I asked, as he stood at the door. To your house, he said. Depending on whether you want a divorce and how you want to file for it, you may need proof, so we will have to install several cameras and microphones throughout the house. Even if you don't want a divorce, you will need some kind of proof to confront her. This way she won't be able to tell you some ridiculous story about how you imagined it all. And in the very unlikely possibility that you don't even want to confront her now, you may need to have proof in the future, just in case. How many cases like this have you seen, I asked. The look on his face and his silent shake of his head said it all. At least a hundred or so, he said quietly. I was forced to immediately change my mind about him. How long have you been in this business, I asked. I thought he was barely 20. Now it suddenly dawned on me that maybe he was one of those guys like Dick Clark, who just looked young. Perhaps I had my seasoned veteran after all. Three years, he said. I'm 25. Hearing his words didn't make me feel any better. In fact, the news that the end of my idyllic life and marriage was just a statistic depressed me even more. We went to my house, and he followed me in his car. When we arrived home, Ashley came out to meet him. I introduced him as the guy from the car dealership. She smiled and continued with her business. We installed cameras with microscopic holes throughout the house, including our bedroom. We also added a small device to the phone lines that allowed us to monitor all phone calls. After I walked him to the door, I immediately went to the computer to listen to the call she was currently making. Yeah, he brought some guy from the car dealership with him, she said. We both know they're not going to honor his warranty they'll make him pay for the repairs. He's my little man. What can I say? I love him, but he'll never be a tough guy. After a while, she came into the bedroom. She rolled over and hugged me, starting to kiss me. I pushed her away from me. After a few minutes, I felt her fingers crawling up my leg. I looked at her and saw her smiling. I'm not in the mood, I told her. She looked shocked. Since when do you have to be in the mood, she asked. Damn it, Mark. It's just a car. It's not even that good of a car. Forget it. Then she rolled to the other side of the bed. Over the next few days, she stuck to her usual routine. It seemed like Tyler came to visit her every day. Listening to their phone calls and watching them whenever I could stand it helped me gain strength for what I needed to do. It was funny because... Ever since I found out about her and started distancing myself from her, she seemed to be taking it out on poor old Tyler. In fact, yesterday he received nothing at all. They had a fight. Damn it, Tyler, she snapped at him. I don't like this. You don't even know what you're doing. I'll give you a hint I need to get excited first. I thought you liked it hard and fast, he said. I like it from time to time, she replied sharply. But we've always done it this way, he complained. This is what we do together. If I wanted to make love to someone, it would be someone I love. Damn, that's why I come to you and not my damn wife. What's your problem? I don't know, she said. Mark hasn't touched me in a week. Ever since his damn car broke down, he's been acting weird. All the things he used to do for me, he's skipping. He seems to blame me for the car. You're still going to ask him to sponsor me to join the lodge, aren't you, asked Tyler. Well, yes, said Ashley but I was waiting for a better time. It's probably not a good idea to ask him to do this when he's not in the best mood. Yesterday, he came home, 
played with the baby, went for a run, and then played with the baby again until she fell asleep. When he came back, we didn't even talk. Maybe when he fixes the damn car, he'll feel better, Tyler said. He should be finished with it. I didn't even ask him, Ashley said. I'll ask today, Tyler. I really miss him. It's not just the sex, although I miss that too. It's all the little things, like him coming home and massaging my shoulders or rubbing my legs. It seems like an eternity since we just sat and watched TV together or sat on our porch and talked. Blah. Blah, blah. Tyler said, I don't care about your marriage. Are we going to have sex or not? Or not, Ashley said angrily. Call me when you pull your head out of your ass. When I got home that night, Ashley asked me about the car. She cooked all my favorite dishes for dinner and walked around the house in a very low-cut blouse and a very short skirt. Under normal circumstances, I would be delighted, but in this case, I knew she was just horny because she had a fight with her boyfriend. Mark, honey, how's the repair going on your car, she asked, coming close. Coming along, I said. Maybe you should be a little more assertive with them and stop letting everyone push you around, she said. I need my car too, you know. I walked over to the table and took my car keys. I took Ashley's car keys off the key fob and placed them in her hand, then sat back at the table to eat. Mark, that's not what I meant, she said. You're upset, and all this is bothering you, so it's bothering me too. I love you, Mark. Yes, that's what you say, I thought. You love me so much that you would do anything for me, except stay faithful. You love me so much that you have sex with another man in our house, in our bed where we sleep. I thought about saying it, but as always, I didn't. I just screamed inside myself again. She must have seen my rage in my eyes. I thought I was strong. I knew the words I needed to say, but freezing in place, I let the moment slip away. Her eyes widened when, instead of responding to her words, I simply moved away from the table, leaving my dinner untouched. Mark, she called as I walked away. I didn't answer. I just went to look at my sleeping daughter. I love this little girl more than life itself. If it weren't for her, I probably would have left Ashley the first day I found out about her and Tyler. I closed the door behind me and walked through the house. I grabbed my gym bag and went outside. Mark, where are you going? Ashley asked. Without a word, or even turning to her, I simply picked up my gym bag. Mark, the gym is a mile away. How are you getting there? She asked. I can handle it, I replied. When I returned home, it was already after midnight. While I was at the gym, beating another punching bag, I made a decision it's time to end this farce called my marriage. I had all the evidence I needed to get Ashley to give me what I wanted. The problem was my daughter. If I got custody, I would have to arrange childcare and visitation and all that. I wanted everything to be ready when we filed for divorce. There was also the problem of confronting Ashley and handing her the papers. My parents loved Ashley, and her parents loved me. This would be a terrible blow for both families. Mark Ashley called as I walked up the stairs. You've been away from home for so long. I didn't answer. I just went to the bathroom to take a shower. As I let the warm water flow over me, the shower door opened. Ashley came into my shower and hugged me. Ashley, I said, in a very indifferent tone. Everything hurts, I tried to keep my voice as neutral as possible. I didn't want to show any anger, and at the same time, I was tired of her hurting me. I wondered if she'd ever know how painful it is to sit and listen to a tape of a woman who supposedly loves you calling you a coward while talking to another man. I wondered if she knew how much it hurt to be constantly put down by being called my little man or other similar expressions. Mark, it's been two weeks now, she retorted angrily. What have I done? I didn't break your car, it wasn't me, Mark. She walked out of the bathroom, still dripping water. I could hear her crying as I calmly dried myself off and went downstairs to sleep on the couch. I think she expected me to come into the bedroom and try to comfort her. I mean, that's how I'd always reacted in situations like this. This was how I always did it before. Perhaps this was the beginning of change. The next morning, I woke up early to get to work on time. I hadn't really done anything about my car in the last two weeks. There was no need because there was nothing really wrong with it. All it needed was maintenance, which I did the next day. I just kept letting Ashley think there was a problem with the car. 
because I needed a reason to act differently than usual. I decided to just take the car to the dealership to get something done, maybe change the oil or rotate the tires or something, so I wouldn't have to explain anything about the damn car. I told my secretary that I had an errand to run and drove to the Ford dealership. While I was waiting for the service technician to speak to me, I looked around. You're driving a Taurus, aren't you, he said after a few minutes. They're great cars. Reliable, easy to handle, and they'll never give you any problems. How long have you been driving this one? More than 10 years, right? I'm confused. When he described my car, he unknowingly described me. Reliable, unpretentious, never creating problems. It was me. I went to work every damn day and provided for my daughter and that cheating wife. I never asked for anything and always did what was expected of me even when she was throwing herself at some scoundrel ex-colleague. Reliable and unpretentious also meant inconspicuous. I could sit here and scream and beg for her to stop forever and it would never matter because she wouldn't notice or care what she was doing to me or to us. To hell with us. In fact, we no longer existed. There was no more us. Not for a moment. Not a second more. The words came out of me before I even realized what I was saying. I need a salesman, I said. I'll get someone for you, he said, and brought over the salesman. I took it for a test drive as if I was in a trance. As I drove through the streets, I noticed that almost everyone I passed noticed me. This is exactly what I wanted. On the way back to the dealership, I took out my phone and called the lawyer I had hired. I told him he needed to file for divorce today. They were ready last week, but I didn't want to serve them. I told him to go ahead and give them to Ashley and Tyler. I told him that, with any luck, he could catch them together at my house in about an hour. My second call, as soon as I pulled into the parking lot, was to my insurance agent. I updated my insurance policy to include a new car. I needed to get insurance quickly because it was now my car. I had no intention of returning it. When I sat down with the salesperson, I tried to keep a neutral expression. I can offer you a deal on the interest rate, he said. How much do you need as a down payment, I asked. Well, we have to, he began. Listen, I said. I just need a number. My insurance agent called the dealership while we were signing the paperwork. He faxed proof of insurance and I pulled out of the parking lot. The roar of the engine was music to my ears. I smiled at a couple of women as I stopped next to them at a traffic light. This was another change I would never have done this before. When I pulled into my driveway, I noticed that the door to my house was open. My timing was not very good. I expected Ashley to be home, but I didn't think Tyler would still be there. All I heard from inside the house was Tyler screaming and Ashley crying. Several of my neighbors came up to me as I got out of the car. It's good that you're home, said my next door neighbor. She and that guy who always comes to visit her have been fighting for a long time. Whose car is this? Mine, I said, smiling. Damn, he said. Wait till I tell Ellen you bought a brand new Mustang, she'll be begging you for a ride. You probably shouldn't tell her, Sam, I said, winking at him. You may not get her back, and I'm in the market, looking for another woman to match the new car. He simply smiled and nodded at me as I walked into the house. Ashley looked terrible. She had cried a lot. She kept turning over the pages of the divorce documents. Both she and Tyler looked at me as I walked through the door. Mark, I don't understand, she cried. I don't want a divorce. We can fix this. It was a mistake. Tyler came up to me. Listen, Mark, why are you including me in your divorce, he asked. I have a wife and two children. If you drag me into this, it will probably ruin my marriage too. My wife has nothing to do with this. Don't you feel sorry for my children? I just looked at him. I was surprisingly calm. Both of them spoke at the same time, blaming each other. I sat down at the kitchen table to think about what I should eat. Let's all sit down like adults and talk about this, Tyler said. I'm sure we can resolve this to everyone's satisfaction. Both of them also sat down at the table. They both kept talking, or, rather, Tyler was talking, Ashley was crying. Listen, Mark Tyler started again. I know it looks bad, but there's nothing here, really. It happened one time, and it was just sex. You see both me and Ashley. Well, we both like rough sex, and neither you nor my wife are into that. You don't because you love Ashley, but my wife. Because she's romantic. She's more into flirting and kissing, 
and all that nonsense. So we both had unfulfilled needs, but this one time cleaned out our systems. This will not happen again. You understand this, don't you? I didn't say a word. Ashley took this as a sign that it was her turn to speak. Mark, you're the only man I love. I don't want a divorce. That's why I've been acting so weird lately because you haven't been like yourself. Tyler started again. Listen, Mark, you're not the kind of person to act hastily. Be smart, there's no that was all he had time to say. He wrung his hands and whined, but then moved from that to standing over me. His voice took on an almost menacing tone. Old Mark might have listened to him, but I've changed. I stood up so quickly that neither of them probably realized what had happened until it was too late. The old Mark would have let the anger build up inside him and would have taken it out later by running to relieve the pain or going to the gym to beat up an innocent punching bag. But I've changed. I was no longer the old Mark. I didn't think I just reacted. Even before my legs pushed off to lift me out of the chair, my arm was in motion. I made an open palm strike to Tyler's chin. I think my goal was to push him back because I didn't like the way he was looming over me. I probably took it as a threat. I underestimated my timing, my anger, and my strength. I also underestimated Tyler's luck. My shot hit the target. His jaw snapped shut with almost enough force to break it. The only thing that saved him from that was his neck snapping back, absorbing most of the force. It still sent him flying backward and upward, knocking him out of his chair and landing him awkwardly on the floor, on his back. Ashley was shocked that her soft-spoken little man would do something like that, but she was in for an even bigger shock. Tyler writhed on the floor, covering his face with both hands, making incomprehensible sounds. Ashley looked at me, and I shrugged. It looks like he bit his tongue off, I said calmly. She jumped over to him while he was still writhing in agony from the pain. Mark, call an ambulance, she shouted. To hell with it, I said. Tyler steeled himself, despite the pain, and started pointing outward. I'll take him to the ER, she said. On what I asked calmly. In my car, she said. I paid for this car, I said. He won't get in it. Mark, she said, pleading, sign the divorce papers, and you can take it. No way, she said, picking up the phone. She dialed 911. A few minutes later, an ambulance arrived and took Tyler to a nearby clinic. I never left the kitchen. Neither Tyler nor his injuries concerned me. After the ambulance left, Ashley returned to the house. She spent a few minutes talking with some neighbors. Whose Mustang is in the driveway, she asked. Mine, I said. You bought a new car, she asked, incredulous. Yes, I did, I replied calmly. It's time for a change. She just stood there, stunned. I think this was the first time she realized that I was serious about the divorce. Maybe this is the first time she realized that I could change. I turned and went upstairs to pack a few more things. When I came back downstairs, Ashley was still standing in the same place. She had a pleading look on her face. Mark, please talk to me, she begged. I'm sorry I know I messed up, but I love you. We can work this out. I'll do anything to make it up to you. I just looked at her. Ashley, I said, you've said it all before. Every time you get caught, you promise to change. But you never do. I'm tired of being lied to, being taken for granted. I deserve better. I walked past her and out of the house. I got into my Mustang, started the engine, and drove away. It felt good to be in control again. It felt good to be free.